All right, y'all. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce James Gossel from Clemson University, who will tell us about Koi Macaulay Power Edge Ideals of Trees. James. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you to the organizers, uh, not just for the invitation, but for organizing this great session throughout the semester. It's been really great. Um, I've enjoyed a lot of the talks. And um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so this talk is not going to be your typical commutative algebra talk. And so I thought it would be worth it just for everybody to take about two minutes and provide a roadmap of, of what we're going to actually be talking about today. So um, at the beginning, we're actually gonna start in the world of vertex covers. So vertex covers uh, arrive, uh, arise naturally in graph theory. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done on how to find the minimal vertex cover of a graph. And that in and of itself could be not just a talk, but uh, perhaps a whole course uh, dedicated to vertex covers. And then um, after that, we're gonna talk about edge ideals. So edge ideals um, are basically a, a way to take a graph and think about a polynomial ring. And it turns out that the algebraic properties of edge ideals are very closely related to the comb combinatorial properties of the graph. In, in particular, if you can find the minimal vertex covers of the graph, you can use that information to talk about edge ideals. And so that's gonna be my introduction, but that's actually not uh, the main part of the talk. So after the introduction, then we're going to go into the world of electrical engineering. Um, and we're actually going to talk about this, uh, this idea of phasor measurement units. So monitors for an electrical grid. So this is not a natural problem that arises in graph theory. This is a real world problem in the physical world. And so for those of you who like me are not as inclined to applied mathematics, uh, just hang in there. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna get through it together. It's not gonna be very long because immediately we're gonna talk about graph theory. Um, and it turns out that this problem, the PMU problem uh, can really just be thought of as a graph theory combinatorial problem. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and give a little bit of background um, on the PMU problem. But then that's all coming back to algebra. So the whole idea is we're going to define the power edge ideal, which is sort of analogous to the edge ideal in the world of vertex covers. We can actually talk about like something else, a power edge ideal, which arises from this PMU problem and um, kind of try to um, do the same sort of technique or the same sort of process to find um, commutative rings with certain homological properties by using graphs. And so I'll explain that. And then at the end, we'll talk about the main theorem that we found, which really connects uh, all three worlds together. Um, and so that's sort of the roadmap for the talk. And so if you want to think of it as like the first little bit is motivation. So the vertex covers and edge ideals, I think is really important because that was, that was where it all started in terms of the idea to even consider power edge ideals. But then for the rest of the talk, um, we'll be talking about power edge ideals. So there's the roadmap and let's go ahead and uh, get started. So the first definition is a vertex cover. So a vertex cover given a graph, um, a vertex cover of G is a subset B prime of the vertex set such that for each edge in the graph, either um, for each edge VI, VJ in the graph, either VI is in the vertex cover or VJ is in the vertex cover. And then a vertex cover is minimal if it does not properly contain another vertex cover. Okay, so I think the best way to just uh, think about this definition is to look at an example. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my whiteboard. So if you need to um, pin my screen or make it full screen or whatever you need to do, you can go ahead and do that. So I have the same graph drawn three times. So here's how vertex covers work, very simple. Um, I'm trying to pick a set of vertices such that every edge is incident to one of the vertices that I choose. So um, I can start anywhere. I'm gonna circle the vertices in my selection. So if I pick this vertex, then I've observed those three edges and I can keep going. I can pick this vertex and observe that edge, this vertex and observe that edge. Um, I can pick the middle vertex and observe these two edges 
and how about the bottom vertex? And so now this set of five vertices is chosen in such a way that every edge is incident to one of these vertices. All right, so this is called a vertex cover. I wanna do this two more times because you might've noticed that if I was trying to do this in the optimal way, meaning I'm trying to choose a vertex cover with the fewest number of vertices, well, this vertex up here really isn't necessary. Once I chose all my vertices, I could have really left that one out and just chose this one, this one, and this one, and this one. And that would also be a vertex cover, but every one of these vertices would be necessary. If I were to remove any one of these vertices, it would no longer be a vertex cover. So we actually call this a minimal vertex cover. Minimal vertex cover. And then if you have been thinking about this as I've been working this out, can we do even better? Um, is there a way to only choose three vertices? And you can look at it for a few seconds. Turns out there is a way. Yeah, so I could choose this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. And that would be the fewest vertices that I need to have a vertex cover. And so this is what we would call a smallest vertex cover. And as I mentioned before, the problem of finding the smallest vertex cover is um, you know, a really natural problem that would arise in graph theory. We actually aren't gonna spend too much time on smallest vertex covers. We're actually gonna talk more about the idea of a minimal vertex cover because of the algebraic properties that that, um, that gives us when we, when we look at that. Okay, so that's our first definition. And here's another quick example, not just of finding a minimal vertex cover, but for this graph, I've actually written out all three of the minimal vertex covers. So this is a pretty basic graph with just four vertices. And so you can go through and verify that each of these three sets are indeed vertex covers and that every vertex is necessary to make it a vertex cover. All right. The next definition I wanna give, now we're moving to the algebra. So I wanted to find the edge ideal. So given a graph with D vertices, um, we can think about a polynomial ring with D variables, each variable corresponding to one of the vertices in the graph. So here, A, you could just think of as a field, perhaps the complex numbers or the real numbers. And we're going to define the edge ideal, I sub G in our ring, um, as the ideal generated by all of the edges in the graph. All right, so quick example, let's look at this same graph that we just showed. Um, this graph has four edges. And so the edge ideal would be generated by each of these edges. So x1, x2, because v1, v2 is an edge. x2, x3, because v2, v3 is an edge, and so on. So that is the edge ideal. Okay, so this seems pretty straightforward. You can take a graph, you can create a polynomial ring if you want to, you can define the edge ideal, but um, how does the structure of the graph have anything to do with the algebraic properties of the ring? So this is where um, we're gonna revisit the fact that the minimal vertex covers for this graph were these three sets, uh, V1, V3, V4, V2, V3, and V2, V4. Um, and it turns out that the edge ideal, which we just defined, is going to always have the following M irre irreducible decomposition. It's just going to be the intersection of all of the sets of minimal, uh, of the vertices in the minimal vertex covers. Okay, so in this example, um, this edge ideal, which can be written just using the edges in the graph, it can also be written as the intersection of these three ideals x1, x3, x4, x2, x3, and x2, x4. James, sorry, I think there's a there's a question um, yes. in the chat. Um, oh, I, I, I think it's it. being answered in the chat, but um, I can maybe I just want to call well. yeah. everybody. Mm -hmm. So V2 is not going to be a vertex cover because it does not cover this edge between V3 and V4. So it, a vertex cover is a set of vertices which covers the edges in the graph. Yeah, that's a great question. 
And after this slide, we're going to, well, in one more slide, we're going to move on uh, away from Edge Ideal. So if there's any other questions or anybody has any questions, feel free to just ask. Okay, so that's the connection between how you can look at the minimal vertex covers in a graph and um, you can get this irreducible decomposition of the edge ideal. So with that in mind, um, you can then think about, well, you know, for instance, this ideal right here has one vertex cover with three um, vertices and one vertex cover with two vertices. And so this, ed this edge ideal is not going to be Cohen Macaulay because it is unmixed. And there's a lot of, um, I guess there's a lot of um, research that's been done into this. I just want to give one theorem by Villarreal, which says, let G be a tree. It turns out that the following conditions are equivalent for a tree. First off, G is unmixed, meaning that every minimal vertex cover has the same size. So it was not true in that last example. It was not true on the example that we looked at on the board. But if this is true, it turns out this is only true for trees when G is a suspension of a subtree. A suspension simply means to take a, a subtree G prime and tack on an edge and a vertex to every vertex in the tree. We'll look at a, an example of that. And then it turns out that if, if these conditions are met, um, the edge ideal is Cohen-Macaulay. So this completely characterizes Cohen-Macaulay edge ideals in trees. And so here's an example. We have two graphs, T and T prime, two trees in fact. So T is a suspension. So the subtree is this, this path with three vertices. And then you just tack on an edge and a vertex to each of the vertices. T prime is not a tree um, or not a, it is a tree. It's not a, a suspension. Um, there's no subtree that you could um, start with to get this graph as a suspension. Um, in fact, every suspension is going to have an even number of vertices. So that in and of itself would be one way to see that this is not a suspension. And so the, from the theorem, um, T is a suspension of T prime. So, so T is going to be Cohen-Macaulay, or I should say the edge ideal generated by T is Cohen-Macaulay. Whereas if you wanted to look at the edge ideal generated by T prime, that would not be Cohen-Macaulay. Okay, so hopefully th this is, takes care of the introduction. Hopefully you understand how, um, you know, thinking of this uh, combinatorial algebra problem um, has uh, applications both to algebra and perhaps to uh, the graph theory as well. And now we're going to shift gears and move into the world of PMU covers and power edge ideals. I, that's I meant to say on this power edge ideals up here. So, all right, from now on, every graph we're looking at, we could think of it as a power grid. And the vertices are going to be buses, the substations where the transmission lines meet. And then the edges are going to be the transmission lines. All right, so this graph that I've given represents a power system with six buses and six lines. Okay, so rather than selecting vertices in a vertex cover, um, we're going to be placing phasor measurement units on the buses, which are going to help monitor the, the system. Okay, so a phasor measurement unit is a device placed at a bus in an electrical power system to monitor the voltage at the bus and the current and all the lines connected to it. And a PMU placement is just a set of buses, vertices um, that you select to put PMUs on. So here is an example of our power grid. We could put PMUs on uh, V1 and V4 to help monitor the graph. Okay. So a bus, system, a bus in a system is observable if its voltage is known, and a line in the system is observable if its current is known. And a PMU cover is a placement of the PMUs on buses making the entire system observable. So at this point, I still haven't told you how the PMUs work in terms of like how much of the electrical grid can you see with each PMU, but the concept is we're trying to put PMUs on so that we can see the entire grid. And if, if we can do that, then we have what's called a PMU cover. Okay. Any questions at this point? Take a, take a second.
All right. This, is, this slide right here is probably the most important slide for understanding everything else in the talk. So I'm going to go through this slowly and we're going to do a few examples. So here's the rules for how the PMUs observe the graph. So every time you place a PMU on a vertex, then that vertex is observable and every line incident to it is observable. So we're thinking about observing not just the vertices, but also the edges, okay? Then Ohm's law gives us two more rules. So first of all, Ohm's law says that any bus or vertex incident to an observable line is observable. So once you observe any edge on the graph, you automatically observe um, each of the vertices that are incident to that edge. And then it turns out from the third rule that if you can observe the two vertices that are adjacent, then you get to observe the edge connecting those two vertices. So a line incident to two observable buses is a, um, a bus incident to, to an observable line is observable, and a line incident to two observable buses is observable. And then finally, Kirchhoff's law. So Kirchhoff's law is really neat. It says that anywhere in your power grid, if you've observed a bus and you've observed all but one of the lines incident to that bus, then you get the last power line for free, okay? So those are the rules. And I wanna go through an example slowly and we're gonna practice like following these rules to see how this works. So let's just say that I placed a PMU on V1, okay? So according to the first rule, that means I get to observe the power line which is incident to V1. And then according to the second rule, Ohm's law, that says a bus incident to an observable line is observable, I would get to also observe this vertex. And at this point, I'm stuck. You could go through all of the other rules, but there's no rule which is gonna allow me to observe anything else. And so then at this point, I think I need to place another PMU somewhere on this graph. So let's do pretty much the silliest thing we can do and place a PMU on V4, okay, just for the example. So if I place a PMU on V4, I can go through the same process. I get to observe the edge incident to the PMU. By Ohm's law, I get to observe the bus incident to the observed edge. And now I can use this third rule. So the other part of Ohm's law, which says that if I observe two buses that are ad adjacent, I get to observe the edge which connects them. And now this creates a chain reaction because of Kirchhoff's law. So Kirchhoff's law, the last one says, if you've observed a bus and it, you've observed all but one of the power lines incident to that bus, you get the last one for free. So we actually get to observe these two power lines um, because we've observed all but one of the edges from each of these two vertices. Then we can use Ohm's law rule number two again to get these two buses. And then in the final step, we could actually either use Ohm's law or Kirchhoff's law, um, depending on what you want. And we would be able to observe that last edge. So these two PMUs would give us a PMU cover for this graph. Okay. And then the natural question to ask is, could we have done any better, right? I mean, I, I pretty much did the, the silliest thing, right? I did V1 and V4, like the, the two outermost uh, vertices. And the answer is yes, we could have done better. So let's try this one. If we place a PMU on V2, what's gonna happen? Well. At first, we get all of the power lines incident to the PMU. Then rule number two gives us all of the buses incident to observed power lines. And now Kirchhoff's law on vertex five says we've observed all but one of the power lines incident to, to V5. So we get the next one. And then once again, a bus incident to an observed power line is automatically observed. And then we could either use Kirchhoff's law or Ohm's law um, to get this edge right here. Um, Ohm's law says if you observe two buses, you get the edge incident or connecting them. And then Kirchhoff's law would have said that um, you've observed all but one of the power lines from this observed bus. So you get that one for free. Either way, you can use Kirchhoff's law again and Ohm's law, and you can observe the entire system with just one PMU. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, are there any questions at this point? So this is where I can do another example 
um, if folks would want, or I can just move ahead to the algebra. Um, if anybody has a strong preference, uh, you can feel free to shout it out. Otherwise, I'll, I think I'll just move on to the algebra. Okay, I'll just move on to the algebra. So, so this is important though. So this is how, the, the, this is how everything um, works from here on out. So let's go ahead and define the power edge ideal. So here's the idea. Um, in the same way that um, edge ideals could be written as an intersection of ideals generated by the, the variables corresponding to the vertices in each minimal vertex cover, we can do an analogous thing for power edge ideals. So given a vertex, or sorry, given a graph with D vertices, we can consider a polynomial ring with D variables and define the power edge ideal of the graph to be the intersection of the ideals generated by all of the vertices in each um, minimal PMU cover. Now, I think here I said the intersection is taken over all PMU covers. And so just to clarify, and this would be the same with, you could say all vertex covers, or you could just say minimal vertex covers. Um, it's, it's, it's the same definition. Um, when you take the intersection with, if you wanna know what the intersection looks like, you may as well just consider the minimal PMU covers. Okay, so this was the example we just looked at. And you could actually go through and try placing PMUs on V5, V6, and V3 as well. And it turns out that in all of those cases, those singleton vertices would be um, PMU covers. And so the power edge ideal would be the intersection of these ideals. And it's given right here. And so then the question is, all right, so we can define this. Um, is this useful? I mean, is this useful at all? Could we actually generate cone Macaulay rings by using power grids? That's kind of a crazy idea, uh, but let's explore that idea. So before we do that, let me just say this. Um, the PMU placement problem is actually a very uh, well-studied problem um, in combinatorics in electrical engineering. I mean, I think it would be very useful for somebody who ha is um, looking at a power grid to try and determine how to place PMUs in such a way that uh, the, the fewest number of PMUs would be used. Um, an interesting fact about this problem, it's NP complete. And this is from a paper uh, where all four authors last names start with the letter H, which is just awesome. Um, and so, yes, it's been proven that this problem is actually NP complete. When I see NP complete, I tend to turn and run as far away as I can. Um, so we actually won't be looking at that problem in particular. We're, like I said, we'll, we'll be talking about uh, more of an algebraic application. For what we're doing, here's our goal. We wanna study the problem algebraically and find some interesting examples of ideals along the way. Specifically, we will characterize the trees such that the power edge ideal is unmixed or another way of saying that is that all minimal PMU covers have the same size. So that's the question that we were interested in at first is for which trees um, does every minimal PMU cover have the same size? Okay, that was an open problem um, a few years ago. And then finally, we wanna, once we have this information, we wanna study the algebraic properties of the power edge ideals. For instance, is it true that every unmixed tree is going to be Cohen Macaulay as it was with unmixed trees in the context of vertex covers. That may or may not be true. And so we wanna explore that. I've seen a few questions in the chat. So let me, oh, never mind. Okay. So I'm actually just gonna go ahead and give the theorem um, rather than like trying to build up to it. So here's what we were able to find um, for a tree. G, the following conditions are equivalent. And I guess I will say this, this, this first uh, result I'll give is the purely combinatorial result. So we're gonna characterize unmixed trees. So G is unmixed with respect to PMU covers, if and only if every vertex of degree three or greater is adjacent to exactly two vertices of degree two or less, okay? so. If you have a tree, even if it has a million vertices, 
you can pick out all the vertices of degree greater than or equal to three pretty easily, and then just make sure that they're adjacent to exactly two vertices of degree two or less. And if that condition is true, then the, the tree is unmixed. And if that condition is false, then the tree is mixed every single time. And then um, the third condition, which is not very well defined in this slide, but I'll do an example to explain. Um, if these two conditions are true, specifically if the second one is true, um, this only happens when G is obtained by nicely linking a sequence of paths. So here is an example of what I mean. So you can see in this example, we have three paths. So the path on top, path in the middle, path on the bottom. And I've already gone ahead and chosen PMUs, but the idea is um, if you choose a PMU from the path on top, a PMU from the path in the middle, and a PMU from, uh, from the path on the bottom, no matter which PMUs you choose, it's always going to be a PMU cover. And if you omit uh, a PMU from any of the paths, so even if you put PMUs on all of the vertices in the bottom two rows, but did not put a vertex on the top row, or did not put a PMU on the top row, then uh, what you have is not going to be a PMU cover. So there's a few rules for how we define nicely linking a sequence of paths. Um, whenever the paths are connected, they're connected um, not on one of the endpoints of a path, and we don't have two connecting vertices adjacent on the same path. So there's a few technical things uh, to say about what we mean by nicely linking. But I just want to go through quickly and show how this is a PMU cover. I've already put the PMUs on, and I've gone ahead and observed all the incident edges. Ohm's law would give us all the vertices incident to those edges. Then Kirchhoff's law right here would give us the next edge. And then Ohm's law would give us the next vertex. And Kirchhoff's law would give us the next edge. And Ohm's law would give us the next vertex. Well, now Kirchhoff's law doesn't help here, but because you've observed these two vertices, you get the edge linking the two vertices by Ohm's law. And then that just creates this chain reaction. Um, Kirchhoff's law would give you the next edges, Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's law, and Ohm's law. Okay, and so it turns out that that is a PMU cover. All right, so I wanna say a lot of things here. Um, I want to try and explain how condition two and condition three are um, related. Like, how do you get these paths from just the condition that every vertex of degree greater than or equal to three is adjacent to exactly two vertices of degree less than or equal to two? So I want to do a quick example um, on the board. All right, so this might take a minute. I'm going to uh, write down a tree. And then we're going to use that condition to analyze whether or not this tree is unmixed. And if it is unmixed, we're going to try and see where the, the nicely connected paths are in this example. All right. I hope everybody can see that. Okay. So um, according to the theorem, we would try and determine if this is unmixed by examining all the vertices of degree uh, greater than or equal to three. So I'm gonna go ahead and, I'm just gonna go ahead and circle those. I'm not putting a PMU on them right now. This is a degree three vertex. This is a degree four vertex, degree three, degree three, and degree three. Okay, so those are my degree greater than or equal to three vertices. And now I have to check one thing. Is each of those vertices adjacent to exactly two vertices of degree two or less? This one is adjacent to these two non-circled vertices. This one is adjacent to these two. This one is adjacent to these two. This is adjacent to these two. And this is adjacent to those two. So that checks out. So this is unmixed. At least that's what I'm claiming from our result. So how do we look at that and, and know that that's unmixed? Or another way, or another question is, where is the nicely linked paths? So here's where the paths come from. If you look at this graph, every time you have two circled vertices adjacent to each other, you can 
uh, split the graph right there. So I'm going to split the graph right here. I'm also going to split the graph right here between these two. And then I have these two over here, and I'm going to split the graph there. And now when you make those cuts in the graph, what's left is four paths. So here's one path with four vertices. Um, here's one path with five vertices. And then you have this path down here with four vertices. And then you have this path up here with three vertices. So that's what ends up happening every time you have this condition met is you can cut the graph into these paths. Every time you have these paths, you get a graph that's unmixed. And the last direction in the theorem is to show that unmixed implies the condition that every vertex of degree greater than or equal to two to three is adjacent to exactly two vertices of degree less than or equal to two. So pulling up that slide again, I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about the proof of that last direction. One implies two because it's, it's a beautiful technical combinatorial proof, um, but maybe I'll say, I'll spend one minute and say something about the idea of how to prove one implies two. So you would, you would actually prove the contrapositive. So if you had a vertex of degree three or greater that was adjacent to either zero, one, or three or more vertices of degree less than or equal to two, so contradicting this exactly two condition, um, there's, you break up the proof into three cases, one for each of those, whether it was adjacent to zero, one, or greater than or equal to three. And then we were able to develop some techniques for proving that a particular graph is mixed. And our best technique was we found that in any tree, you can always find a minimal PMU cover consisting only of leaves. So um, if you were to put a PMU on every leaf in a tree, that's always going to be a PMU cover. And perhaps by removing a, a few of those PMUs, you could get a minimal PMU cover. So that's an example of a really bad way to choose a PMU cover, a really non-optimal way to choose a PMU cover. And then we were able to prove some conditions on how you can take that PMU cover and slide the PMUs towards the middle of the graph. So if, if you have a PMU cover consisting only of PMUs on leaves, you can take any of those PMUs and slide them up to the next vertex in the graph, and you're still going to have a PMU cover. And then um, our technique each time was to slide some PMUs into the middle of the graph where that vertex of degree greater than or equal to three was adjacent to either zero, one, or more than three more than two uh, vertices of degree less than or equal to two. And we would slide a bunch of the PMUs together and we could always show that one of the PMUs was irrelevant, meaning we could remove it and find a PMU cover that was smaller than something that was already minimal. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of combinatorics in there, um, but that's the idea. Okay, so that's, that's kind of all for combinatorics. Now let's talk about algebra, right? This is an algebra talk. So we should probably say something about what the implications of this are in terms of answering whether these ideals are gonna be Cohen-Macaulay. So, so in this example, the generators, um, or, or whenever you have an unmixed graph, an unmixed tree, the generators are just gonna be the product of the vertices and the paths because the minimal PMU covers are all sets where you pick a vertex from each of the paths. Okay, so this is our power edge ideal, it's a product of x1 through x4, x5 through x9, and x10 through x12. Well, this ideal is not only Cohen-Macaulay, it's actually complete intersection, which is very strong. And it turns out, we so stepping back, we already know that an ideal being complete intersection implies Gorenstein, implies Cohen-Macaulay, implies unmixed. And for power edge ideals, we can actually go the other way. If you start with a tree that is unmixed, its power edge ideal is going to be complete intersection. So this was quite a surprise when we discovered this. Um, it's if and only if. All right, so, um, and just a quick note, um, this is for trees. For arbitrary graphs, uh, Michael Cowan was actually able to find three examples to show that 
that it's not true. None of the implications, the reverse implications are true um, in general for non-trees. And we might, yeah, we'll have a minute to look at that. Um, but that was our surprising result. And so um, this is a lot of information in one slide. And I wanna go through this because um, my goal with this slide is to sort of summarize what we did and how it relates to the problem of vertex covers, which we talked about at the beginning and how some of the connections, like, I don't know, just the connections between these two theorems. So in Villarreal's theorem, so this up here is the world of vertex covers and edge ideals. Um, a graph is unmixed with respect to vertex covers if the following conditions are true, they're all equivalent. And then here's our theorem that a graph is unmixed with respect to the PMU covers um, if and only if any, also all of the conditions are met. So we each have a condition which is a constructive characterization of unmixedness. So in Villarreal's case, um, G is a suspension of a subtree. So that's how you would construct an unmixed graph is you take a tree and then you tack on an edge and a vertex. For us, our constructive characterization was we, um, we build a tree by linking a sequence of paths, all right? And then each of these theorems has a descriptive characterization, a way to look at a tree and know exactly when it's unmixed. And so a suspension, it could be characterized as a tree such that every vertex of degree greater than or equal to two is adjacent to exactly one vertex of degree one, okay? And then in ours, every vertex of degree greater than or equal to three is adjacent to exactly two vertices of degree less than or equal to two. And now this is perhaps, I, I, as far as I know, this is just a crazy coincidence. Why all of our numbers are exactly one bigger than all of the numbers in the context of vertex covers and edge ideals and unmixed graphs with respect to vertex covers. So we just replaced this two with a three, this one with a two, and this one with a less than or equal to two. Um, Michael noticed that um, and I was, I was blown away by that. I was like, this, this doesn't really make sense. This problem arises as a natural problem in graph theory. And this problem is a, a problem connected to a physical real world application, it, this, this seems like it's just a coincidence, but it makes me wonder if there's some other world where um, an unmixed tree is a tree where every vertex of degree greater than or equal to four is adjacent to three vertices of less than or equal to three. I don't know. Um, I'm sure there is a world somewhere out there where that's true. And then uh, finally, the algebraic um, application is that unmixed trees with respect to vertex covers um, pr produce um, Cohen-Macaulay edge ideals. And for us, um, they produce Cohen-Macaulay power edge ideals, but not only Cohen-Macaulay, but also Gorenstein and complete intersection. So that's kind of the big picture tying everything together. Um, I do have a little bit of time and I, I'll just briefly go through, well, just because I, I mentioned this before, um, I have the slides and I, I won't go through the explanation um, in depth, be mostly because these are uh, Michael's examples uh, that, that he came up with. But um, in each case, um, we can find a non-tree, which is Gorenstein, but not complete intersection, or Cohen-Macaulay, but not Gorenstein, or even this one is unmixed, but not Cohen-Macaulay, if we step out of the world of trees and um, just look at all graphs in general. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, let's thank James with our reactions. And folks should feel free to ask any questions, either in the chat or unmute yourself. Would you show just just for kicks the three three slides back? Okay. This one. I think that's, that's a fantastic. A, nope. Yup. That's a fantastic okay. example. Um, and the fact that it's got the structure, you can see a five cycle mm -hmm. of of K threes in there is is not an accident.
That's interesting. That wasn't the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I gave this talk um, a week ago to a general math audience and they were asking about the applications to electrical engineering and uh, <laughs> which I, I think it's worth mentioning that I don't know if this would be very useful to uh, to folks who are either trying to place PMUs or designing power grids, um, except for the fact that if you had an unmixed tree, it means that um, placing PMUs is quite easy, um, and you can you can even there is the what what the what's called the greedy algorithm, which means place a PMU on every vertex in your graph and then just remove PMUs until you get uh, something that's minimal. This is hardly ever a good algorithm because in almost any case, in almost any power grid, um, minimal is not necessarily the smallest, but these are the graphs, these are the trees for which minimal is the smallest and you could actually use that um, algorithm of just pulling off PMUs until you have a minimal PMU cover. <clears throat> Have you thought about, so going back to the observation that you mentioned um, there, yeah, like, could you uh, take the every vertex a degree at most, or at least four is adjacent to exactly three vertices a degree at most three, Yeah. and trying to like reverse engineer what the laws would be and just to see what they would be? Like, could you write down some minimal list of laws that would like help I mean, I don't know, it'd be kind of interesting to see what, what, what the rules would be to uh, um, propagate the ob observations. Yeah, that's a great question. And I've thought about it. I, you know, life is really busy for me right now, so I have not, <laughs> yeah. but it, it would be something really interesting. If somebody could do that, that would be really, really cool to, to try to create a world uh, based off trying to to obtain this characterization, I think that would be really interesting how that would turn out. Hey, I have a question. How you talk? How you talk about how this how the power so this power it's ideal how can be characterized? I mean, uh, how the second power or this power it's ideal could be say something about the graph. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is, called, the second power is called Macaulay. Mm -hmm. Can I say something about the graph or something like that? Or maybe with the symbolic power too. I know he used. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I understood your question. Are you, are you referring to like, this is like the first example and, and this is like the second example, like power edge ideal is like one step up? No, no, no. You, 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 you define a, a new tie knot edge ideal, no? Mm -hmm. Power ideal. The question is, maybe you talk about how he, I can say something about the second power of this new kind ideals. Okay. Yeah. Um. So going back to the definition of a power edge ideal. Yes. So in, in this case, it is, it is defined something like a, mm -hmm. this composition, a primary is composition, something like that. Mm -hmm. And in the natural case, that is the edge ideal. We can say something about the second power of the H oh, idea. Mm -hmm. My question is, I can say I can say something about the second power of the power H idea. Yeah, is called Macaulay. In some cases, said is triangle free. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we've studied that, uh, and it would be something really interesting to study. And it's, I think that just about anything in this world, uh, in, in like our setup. Um, a lot of stuff is open. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of the things that you can consider with vertex covers and edge ideals are open because up until a few years ago, when a few folks started um, thinking about this and coming up with this crazy idea, 
Um, I don't think anybody else had really thought of this. So it'd be something to consider. And I don't really know um, about the second power or other things you could do. You, you know, with edge ideals, if you um, rewrote this intersection as just generators, they're always going to be like two generate. It's going to be like x1, x2 is a product of two variables. Um, but here we have a product of many variables. Yes, many variables. Um, so that's another difference. Um, and the way we define edge ideals, there's kind of two equivalent definitions. Whereas with power edge ideals, there's just this definition, which gives you the intersection. So there's a little bit more work to, um, to rewrite the ideal as such. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's the, the level of technology. We're really banging rocks together on this construction. I mean, we know now, Michael knows how to characterize the generators for the power edge ideal of an arbitrary tree, but we don't know how to do that for a graph that's got a cycle. Just write down the generators without actually, you know, <laughs> taking the decomposition and assembling the, the pieces using the LCMs of the gener. Yeah. So, excuse me. Yes. For the theory at the end of the presentation, mm -hmm. we use induction to show all the stuff. If we such as induction on a number of vertex, something like that. Can we use induction for to prove what part of the theory? all of this equivalent? All of it. Yeah. Um, there is definitely induction that was used in the. Uh, I guess that three implies one part in the part I alluded to where it's like a purely graph theory combinatorial result. Um, How you try everything? I think everything can be induction on, right? Because we only have induction on a number of vertex, right? This is very useful, but very, very straightforward method we always use in the algebra. Well, so the the difficult thing with just saying induction on a tree is that you could prove something for a tree with 30 variables but when you go to 31 that doesn't just necessarily that doesn't just mean you add on a leaf you could add on something in the middle of the graph that completely changes a lot of the structure so well, there was induction that was used but it was hard to just say oh we can show this for in vertices and it's easy to to go to n plus one and if you just snip a leaf off of one of these unmixed trees, you might have screwed up the unmixedness. Yeah. So, so pruning doesn't, uh, yeah. Okay. Right, even that one in the upper right-hand corner or the one you have in the picture behind you, that doesn't work, right? That would screw it up, right? If you took uh, off upper, this... The upper right-hand corner. Uh, yeah, that one, yeah. That, yeah. That's, if you wipe that out, it's not unmixed anymore, right? That's right, that's right. Because now this, degree three vertex would be adjacent to three degree two or less vertices. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Good observation. Any other questions for James? All right, let's thank James again. I'll just remind everybody that uh, you'll stick around for for a little bit to socialize and have some T-shaped beverage. And uh, huh. and I also want to remind everybody before I stop the recording that next week uh, we have a slightly unusual week because there are two talks next week. There's one on Monday and one on Wednesday, and they are both at three p.m. But the week after there is no talk. Okay, because that's the day after the election. So we don't have a talk that day. All right, thanks. <laughs>